So Father, we commit this gathering to you this morning. As your family, Lord, we commit this gathering to you and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to have free reign in our meeting this morning. Lord, we pray that lives will be impacted by your presence, Lord. As we sing our praises, Lord, as we worship you from the overflow of our hearts for the good things that you have done for us. And Lord, as we think about that great sacrifice you made on the cross, we want to declare your glory this morning, Lord. Amen.
Father, we thank you that your word is living and true and like a two-edged sword. Father, and we pray for Chris this morning, Lord. We thank you for the time he's given to prepare this word and we ask for your anointing on it. Holy Spirit, we, we pray that you'll come and anoint Chris as he ministers this morning, Lord. Lord, that we may be impacted by the word that you have for us, Lord. That our lives will be changed, Lord, because we want to live lives to serve you, Lord. We want to live lives that glorify you. We pray for your word this morning as it goes forth, that it will find a resting place in our hearts. Amen. Bless you. This morning we'll be continuing our new sermon series that I've titled The Christian in Complete Armour. A Christian in Complete Armour. Three weeks ago, I started this series off with a, an intro um, about the battle that we find ourselves in. And um, a couple of weeks ago, David shared on the, the belt of truth. And I always remember what he kept saying. He said, buckle up, buckle up. Because the belt obviously holds everything together and it holds it in place. So it's really important that we have the belt of truth. Last week, Tim Allen, my friend, shared on courage. Courage isn't a part of um, the armor of God, but it is something that we need, a quality we need as Christians, especially when facing spiritual battles. So if you've missed any of these messages, I would encourage you to go and have a listen to it on the YouTube channel. Catch up with it, because I believe that you will be blessed by it. Anyway, today, this morning, I have the privilege of sharing on the topic of the belt of truth. Sorry, not the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. <laughs> the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. If you have your Bible, please turn to Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. And on the screen there is the ESV. So you can read from that or you can use your phone or whatever. It reads, it says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I just want to just pause there, okay? The intro, I didn't get enough time to elaborate on this part where it talks about that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities. In some translations, it says against principalities and powers. Okay? Um, some commentators believe that this is talking about the rulers or the governing bodies in this world. That's what some believe. But others actually believe that it is talking about a hierarchy of demonic spirits. Okay? Because when you read later on, it says, against the spiritual forces of evil. So in that context, it is talking about demonic forces. Some have said demonic forces behind the governing powers in this world as well. So when you think about it, um, I was reading this helpful um, commentary on it, and the commentator made a comment saying that um, it's, a, it's like a hierarchy of demonic spiritual forces powers okay with the devil sitting on top and he has his demonic spirits or fallen angels who are seven under him not all of them are concerned with coming to you know torment you they've got bigger fish to fry <laughs> some of them are involved in wars okay instigating wars and big things that are happening in this world evil things that are happening some of them are in charge of that the little ones are in charge of maybe bothering you here and there. Okay? So there's a hierarchy there. So that's what it's talking about. And Paul was saying that we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Not all our battles are physical, he was saying. But they are spiritual. And sometimes our battle that we, we face are against this demonic or against these demonic entities. He goes on and he says, because of that, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That means if we have any chance of standing against the spiritual um, battle or standing against the demonic spirits, we have to take up the whole armor of God. Not just some, take all up, the whole armor of God. And he goes on and he says this, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. 
Don't run. Don't turn your back. But stand firm. He says again, stand therefore. There's an emphasis here. Don't run. Stand therefore. Having fastened on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, which you're looking at today. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, not some, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that, end, um, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. A bit of an intro into the breastplate of righteousness. So it is believed that Paul wrote the epistle of Ephesians while he was in prison in Rome. That's what some commentators believe. As a prisoner who was known for preaching a message that led people away from paganism and talked about the gospel, Okay, and finding our identity in Christ, he was a, sort of like a high-profile prisoner in prison. Because he was turning the whole Roman Empire up and down with this gospel, with this Christ as resurrected. We're preaching salvation in Christ Jesus, saying that there's one true God and that the emperor is not to be worshipped. He was a high-profile prisoner. And some commentators have said that being a high-profile prisoner in Rome, you would have been guarded by two Roman guards. So when he was writing this, he had like a Roman guard on his side and on the other side, and they were chained to him, making sure that he wouldn't escape. I explained on Easter Sunday that the Roman soldiers were so strict, the order, they were so strict. If you, if you lost a prisoner, you would exchange your life for that prisoner. So for a high-profile prisoner like him, they made sure he wasn't going anywhere. And some commentators have said that, you know, with the guards, the guards were perhaps clothed in their whole armor. So perhaps that was where Paul got the inspiration from. Others have said that, no, actually, in the guard in the prison, you wouldn't have the, the guards dressed in their whole armor. But perhaps because he was in Rome, he saw these soldiers. And the Holy Spirit inspired him to write about the whole armor of God. The breastplate of the Roman soldier. Let's look at the breastplate for a second. In his book, Dressed to Kill, Rick Renner described the breastplate that the Roman soldier in Paul's day would have worn. The breastplate. And apparently it looked something like that. He wrote, the breastplate was extremely elaborate and beautiful. It was made either of bronze or brass, usually brass. The breastplate was said to be the heaviest weaponry that the Roman soldier wore. It was said to be the, um, it was said to have weighed in excess of 18 kg, which some known to be as heavy as 35 kg. Yeah, some known to be as heavy as 35 kg. Let me just give you a bit of a, some perspective. So my son Jeremiah, who is seven years old, um, we weighed him the other day, and he wasn't up to even 25 kg. Now, I can't imagine carrying Jeremiah on my back or around me, just that weight. And the Roman soldiers used to march for hours, miles, wearing it. I can't imagine having that weight on me in battle. Can you imagine that weight? So it wasn't just something simple. It was heavy stuff. It was heavy stuff, but it had a function to protect them. It was said that it was made of pieces of metal that were held together, as you see there, sort of like a fish scale, to enable them to have some movement and some mobility. So when you see images of, let's say, them wearing the armor and it's just a metal, that's not what it looked like. It was sort of like sewn together to give, it, to give them some mobility. The function of the breastplate. The breastplate protected the vital organs of the body giving the Roman soldier a sense of protection from the enemy's attack. Generally, when, when we think about our body, our chest area and our stomach area, it's a, a wider surface of our body. Plus, we have our vital organs as well there. 
If someone was to maybe, if you are a soldier, and someone was to maybe catch you on the arm or something, with medical attention, you can live to fight another day. <laughs> but if it's your vital organs, even trying to stop the bleeding, it's very difficult to do. So this armor was essential. It was core in protecting and preserving the soldier's life. And what was Paul saying? Paul was saying that that's how vital the breastplate is in protecting the soldier. And so righteousness is also so vital. It is key in protecting the believer. Just as how the breastplate was so important to preserving the life of the soldier, that is how righteousness to the believer is so key in protecting you in spiritual battle. It's key in your walk of faith. It's that important. But what is righteousness? We're going step by step. I want to pick some things up here. What is righteousness? Righteousness is defined as the quality of being morally right or justifiable. Being morally right or justifiable. And when we think about being morally right, we must also think about having a moral law in order to live in accordance to that. Okay? To, to be morally right or to have a law that governs, that you, is used to govern in the land, you need to have that, that law in place in order for you to live in accordance to that law so that you can be righteous in accordance to the law. If you have a lawgiver, a moral lawgiver, you also have, if you have a moral law, then you also have a moral lawgiver. And one of the key aspects of this is the knowledge of righteousness. Righteousness is a knowledge thing, but it's also a heart issue, or it's also an action as well. If you have a law that has been given, let's say the moral law of the land, you need to know what the law is in order to live in accordance to it. You need to have that knowledge. And that is what actually influences your action to live in accordance to that. Let me give you a quick example as well. Let me ask you a question. I think sometimes we all struggle with this. The reality is sometimes we often know the right thing to do. How many people can say that they often know the right thing to do, but they don't always do what you're meant to be doing. You have some people that give you the best advice, but actually when you look at their life, you realize that they're not taking their advice. A lot of us know what to do, but actually living it out, and it's similar to righteousness. I remember when I was growing up in Ghana, if I was being naughty, and you know, they are, I've been told of many times, and I was not listening. Do you know what got me doing the right thing? If the person looked at me and said, when your dad comes, I will tell him. <laughs> I straight out, like, when the person says that, all of a sudden it's like the angel in me comes out. I know the right thing to do. I know the right thing to do. Sometimes we have the knowledge of it, but actually living it out is a difficult thing. And righteousness is both a knowledge thing as well as a heart issue and putting it into actions. In 2 Corinthians 6, 7, Paul says this about righteousness. About righteousness. He says this, In truthful speech and in the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. One hand and on the other. It is not just a knowledge thing, it is both. It is knowledge and also action. Let's look at the knowledge of righteousness, therefore. By definition, righteousness is the quality of being justified. It's the quality of being justified. To be justified in a theological sense or in the Christian sense simply means to be pronounced righteous or just in the sight of God. That is what it means. When the Lord says that you are righteous, or when scripture says you are justified, it means to be pronounced righteous in the sight of God. But the reality is, is that when we look at our lives, the reality is we know we are all sinners. We know the things that we do. We know the things that we have done. We know the things that we were meant to do and did not do it. And therefore, are we righteous? 
are we righteous? And lots of people wrestle with that. We know we've broken the laws of God. Let's look at some of the basic laws that we have in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, for example. I always use this. Or thou shalt not lie. Let's think about that. How many of us have lied in our lives before? Come on, let's not just be too overly spiritual. Let's be honest here. And for those who have got your hands down, the Lord is looking. Okay? (laughs) We've all lied. We've all said a lie. We've all taken something that does not belong to us before. We've all broken these basic things. Some of us, even before we walked in here today, we broke some of them before we came. We are helpless at keeping these things. And therefore, when we read Romans 3.20, this is what Paul says. Paul says this, For by works of the Lord, no human being will be justified in his sight. For by works of the Lord, no human being will be justified. If we want to go on the basis of the Lord, no one will be pronounced just. No one will be pronounced righteous before God. Why did he say this? He said this, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Because it is through the law that we know what right and wrong is. It is through the law that we understand that we have transgressed the law. It is because there's a law, that is the reason why there's that knowledge of sin. He goes on and he says this um, from verse 23 to 25. He says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, And are justified, again, are pronounced righteous, are pronounced just in the sight of God by his grace. Grace means unmerited favor. You have not merited it. You have not earned it. We have been pronounced just. We have been pronounced righteous before God by his grace. It's unmerited favor. And it doesn't stop there. He says, as a gift, to make it very clear. That you have not earned it. This is a gift that has been given to you. He says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. We receive this gift of righteousness to be called just in the sight of God by faith. It is not by our actions. This is not something we earn or something we do. Philippians 3, 8 to 9 says this. Indeed, This is also Paul saying this. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And this is the point. Not having a righteousness of my own. Not having a righteousness on my own. Because if I have a righteousness of my own or or trying to live in accordance to the law, I am helpless, hopeless at keeping it. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness through God, uh, from God that depends on faith. Again, the righteousness from God that depends on what? Faith. Faith, putting your faith in Jesus. That is how we receive this righteousness. So basically, this is not the righteousness that we do. This is not the righteousness that we work for. This is not the righteousness that we earn. This is a righteousness given by grace, by unmerited favor. This is the knowledge of righteousness that we need to have, church. When it talks about the breastplate of righteousness, this is the knowledge of that righteousness that we need to have in Christ Jesus, that we have been justified through Christ Jesus before God and we have been made right, we've been made right before him through faith. This is the knowledge of righteousness. The Lord has given it to us freely. This is what we have. And I want to share some implications of this righteousness or sometimes how this affects us and the importance of having this knowledge of this righteousness. Church, If you don't know that you are right or justified before God, if you don't know that you are right or justified before God and you don't have this knowledge with you, it affects your sense of worth and how you approach God and engage in spiritual battle. It affects you. It's like a child that feels rejected by their parents. It leaves that child wondering whether they are loved and accepted. It affects the way that child relates to their parents and also 
relates to other people as well. If anything happens to that, that child, and maybe they are worried about something, they can't go to their parents to seek comfort. Why? Because they feel rejected. There's that fear that they have. And church, sadly, a lot of Christians are living in fear, disappointment, and often praying defeated prayers. Why? Because they still have the mentality that they are sinners. They still have the mentality that they are not saved yet. They still have the mentality that God isn't pleased with them. They still have the mentality that they are perhaps alienated from God, that God isn't pleased with them. And church, if you don't have this righteousness in your mind or you don't actually take it on board to understand that in Christ, through faith in Christ, you who have put your confidence in Christ, you have been pronounced just it is very difficult to wage your battle because you don't even have the confidence to stand before the enemy. But you are a child of God. You have been pronounced just. I'm not saying that because of that, you stand and if you are sinning or you're committing sin, you are ignorant of it. No, that's the reason why we confess our sins this morning. But actually to take that on board, to keep that in mind that you are, you have been made righteous, through faith, it's important. It's a knowledge thing. Church, the battle is in our minds. The battle is often in our minds. When the devil came to Jesus to tempt him, what did he say to, to Jesus? He said to him, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, it was an assault on his identity his understanding of his identity. That was it. An assault on that. To question whether he truly is the son of God. To make him doubt whether he is the one who he claims to be. To make him doubt that. And church, it's the same when it comes to spiritual battles as well. In our minds, we need this righteousness of Christ. There are some thoughts that we have that are not our thoughts. There are some thoughts that we have that are not our thoughts. There are some thoughts that are straight from the pits of hell. I'm telling you this. They're not your thoughts. Such thoughts like, oh, you good for nothing. Thoughts like, your parents didn't even love you. Who loves you? Thoughts like, the reason why you're lonely is because no one cares for you. No one truly loves you. Thoughts like, you're useless. There's some thoughts that come to our mind that are straight from the pits of hell. To challenge this righteousness that we have been given, the knowledge of this righteousness that we have. Sometimes the assault also is in the form of images and sinful things that we may have done in the past. Yeah? Sometimes that's what the assault is. And you are reminded of some of the things that you have done in the past. Images that come to your mind of things that you have done and you do not do anymore. It is an assault on your mind to undermine the righteousness or the knowledge of righteousness that you have in Christ Jesus. Are you truly righteous or oh, you're a sinner? You did all of these things. You think God has forgiven you. Images of things that you have done to make you relive that experience. Although you have gone beyond that, the knowledge of righteousness is key. To be able to stand and say, no, I have the righteousness of Christ by faith. I'm no longer that person. It is important. There's also another form of attack that is in the form of implanted thoughts and aroused odd inclinations. I don't know whether you've experienced this before. Implanted thoughts, you know that, where did this thought come from? And it's not just a thought, but it has this, inclin this arousedness that comes with it. I remember some years ago, it was the first time I had this attack in my life. I had a, a dream, and the dream was so vivid of me doing something. And I woke up from the dream, but when I woke up from the dream, and when I woke up from that dream, do you know what it felt like? It felt like I have actually done that in real life in the past. That was what it felt like. 
And I woke up and I had to pray and I'm like, Did I, have I actually done this before? But I realized this is an attack on your mind to make you feel that you are not righteous in Christ, to make you feel that you are a sinner. Sometimes these thoughts also come in your mind and you're like, actually, I haven't done it. Where did these thoughts, these are not my thoughts. And church, a way that you can stand against these thoughts and stand firm in the righteousness that you have been given is to confess and say it, recognize it as it is. These are not my thoughts. I reject them in Jesus' name. I reject them in Jesus' name. I have the righteousness of Christ now. That is some of the ways that we can wage this battle, to identify the enemy's attack as it truly is. It is key. It is key. This is the righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus, and this is the knowledge aspect of this righteousness. Church, a key aspect of righteousness is not only having the knowledge of what is right, acceptable and godly, but also living in accordance to it. Living it out. And I've called this the heart of righteousness or the active righteousness. Actually living a life of righteousness. So it's not just a, it's not just a knowledge thing, but it's also an action that we take on board. Can I just say this? If some of the children are feeling unsettled, we have the crash area, so you can, you can still catch up on the sermon there. So if that's okay, that would be great. Thank you. So we have the heart of righteousness, an active righteousness as well. Okay? An active righteousness. Why should we not just be satisfied with the knowledge of righteousness in Christ? Why shouldn't we just be satisfied with just having the knowledge because as I said a couple of weeks ago, a lot of the enemy's attacks that we face can be avoided if we apply self-control as led by the Spirit and live a godly and righteous life. A lot of the enemy's attacks can be avoided if we submit our will to the Holy Spirit and live a godly and a righteous life. Why do I say this? Because... Church, being a Christian does not make you immune to the consequences of your actions. It doesn't make you immune to the consequences of sin. Not the ultimate consequence, but the consequences of sin in your life. It doesn't. I'll give you a simple example here that maybe you can relate to. And maybe this is not the best example, but let me just share this anyway. If perhaps a Christian and a non-Christian went to a pub and both of them sat there and they were drinking and they drank shots after shots, shots after shots, the Christian doing his share, the non-Christian doing his share, I can assure you that by the end of the night, they will both be legless and someone would have to carry them home. That is the reality. If you open yourself, why? Because they have both come under the influence of what? Alcohol. If you open yourself up to watching some certain things, if you give yourself to watching perhaps pornography, if you give yourself to listening to some certain things, if you give yourself to reading cards and all of these Things, thorough cards and that, things like that, signs and all of that. You are opening yourself up to come under influence. You can't be doing those things and expect not to be influenced by it. You're not immune to it. Although you are a Christian or you claim to be a Christian, these things would take effect in your life. It would affect you. It would affect you. That's the reason why we are told to put on the breastplate of righteousness, meaning that it's not just a knowledge thing, but make it an action as well. It is important. It is important. For example, some people are battling with debt, debt in their lives, which perhaps initially started because they didn't follow the principles of contentment. There's a principle of contentment. You read the book of Proverbs, and it talks about how contentment is important. 
They perhaps didn't follow the principle of contentment. And they kept buying, buying. And now they find themselves in a place where they're spending so much money, the money that they don't even have, on unnecessary things they don't even need. Why? It is a chink in the armor. They've given themselves away because of lack of contentment. And we may say that these are physical things, but church, sometimes these things are areas that the enemy can also use to take a hold in our lives. You may not think about contentment as something of righteous living, but these are key principles. You read scripture, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, and we're told that godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. It's great gain. It's not just enough to have the knowledge. We have to live it. We have to put it on. A couple of years ago, a famous Christian apologist passed away. He was a great communicator of the word of God and was loved by many. He was one of the guys that I go to as well. And I listened to how he debated with other people, his understanding. The guy was brilliant. Really, really good. But after he died, it was revealed that he was involved in all sorts of immoral things, especially sexual immorality. They found pictures of many women on his computer. He visited massage parlors and requested for more than was on the menu. How did he find himself in this dark place? How did he find himself there? A chink in the armor chink in the armor. Because although he knew the righteous standard of God and what was required of him, although he had the knowledge and he taught other people that knowledge, although he had it, sadly he did not put his breastplate on. He didn't put it on. Perhaps it was only that one time that he entertained some lustful attention from the opposite sex. Perhaps it was, he thought, you know what? I've done all of these things. I'm tired. Let me just relax. Let me just enjoy myself a bit. Perhaps that was how it started. And he removed his breastplate of righteousness. And the enemy took hold of him and led him down a downward spiral. To the, ex- to the extent that and now he has lots of pictures of women on his laptop. And guess what has happened? Now it's not only that it's tarnished his name, tarnished his image, not just that, but the legacy of a good Christian organization with some intelligent, brilliant minds in that organization who were defending the faith, that legacy has been destroyed. That organization is no more. Because he entertained it. He did not put the armor on. In church, sometimes that is what it is. Sometimes it is about just entertaining just those little bits of of things. And you just do not know the end result of it. The greater consequence of it. The greater consequence. You think about Samson. What was the greater consequence of him following Delilah? (laughs) When he was told not to. It wasn't because his eyes were just plucked out. And he died a gruesome death. It wasn't just because of that. When you read about something, the main thing that was prophesied on his life was that he would be sort of like a redeemer to the people of Israel. That was what he was. And now the nation has lost that redeemer because of lust, because he did not put his armor on. A greater consequence. Sometimes it's not just because of you. It's not just because of the things that would happen to you. Sometimes it is about the things that would happen to your children coming. Sometimes it is about the church. And church, I would encourage you to pray for ministers. Pray for pastors. It is not easy. Pray. Because we stand and we preach this, but we are also humans. Pray that the Lord protects the integrity of the ministry. Church, it is not enough to have the knowledge of righteousness put your breastplate of righteousness on because the consequences could be far worse than you can imagine. It could be far worse. Let me remind you of this that I shared a couple of weeks ago. Rick Renner, he said this. He said, the truth is, the devil's attacks against our lives wouldn't work if our flesh didn't cooperate. The devil's attacks 
against our lives wouldn't work if our flesh didn't cooperate. If we were truly mortifying the flesh on a daily basis, that's Colossians 3, 5. Living lives that are dead to sin, that's Romans 6, 2. As we are commanded to do in scripture, we would not respond to demonic suggestions and be fleshly and, and to fleshly temptations. Why did he say that? Because dead men are incapable of responding to anything. Thus, we see the power of a crucified life. If we are dead to sin, then it is Christ that lives in us and it is his righteousness that we walk in. If we are dead to sin, then that means that we are walking in the righteousness of Christ. He is the one who lives in us. Sorry, church, this seems like a long message, but it's important, so please bear with me. What can we learn about the breastplate of the Roman soldier and how can we relate to this in our lives in terms of living a righteous life? So I've talked about the righteousness in our mind, the knowledge of righteousness. I've talked about righteousness in terms of action. But let's just look at the breastplate, okay, of the Roman soldier. And let's apply it to our lives, the description of it. The breastplate was said to be the shiniest, most beautiful, and most glamorous piece of weaponry that a Roman soldier possessed. When people walked up to the Roman soldier, they certainly didn't notice the loin belt first. They didn't even notice his shoes or his sword. And as conspicuous as the soldier's helmet was, the piece of armor that immediately caught the attention of onlookers was not his helmet, but his large, shiny, gorgeous breastplate. That was what caught people's attention. How can we, what, what, what points can we take from this? First point is this. Church, righteousness must be noticeable. Righteousness is noticeable. Righteousness isn't something a Christian can conceal. Righteousness isn't something that can be hidden. Righteousness is visible. It is noticeable. What did Jesus say about it? Jesus said that what? You shall know them by their You shall know them by their fruits. Not by their confession of faith, but by their fruits. Righteousness is visible. It is the fruit of being a born again child of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness. Therefore, any son or any daughter that has been born into that kingdom, if you are born again, you are born again to a living hope and you are born again into a righteous kingdom. Your identity is righteousness. It's not something you can hide. It's like myself. If you look at me, you would know that I was born a black mom and a black dad. I was born, I'm a son of Africa. I cannot hide it. You look at the pigmentation on my skin, you know, the melanin. You look at the hair, you know. If I told you that I was a blonde white lady, would you believe me? <laughs> There's no way you would believe me. Church, it's the same. Righteousness. 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 You're born into a kingdom of righteousness. It is visible. It is noticeable. It is who you are. It is who you are. It's not just a knowledge thing. It needs to come from the knowledge to being a heart thing. Part of us, it is who you are. Let me skip through this quickly. The breastplate was the shiniest, most beautiful, and most gorgeous piece of weaponry, meaning righteousness is beautiful. Righteousness is beautiful. It is a beautiful adornment of the Christian. It is beautiful. As the soldier wears it, righteousness causes you to stand out in a dark world. That is what righteousness does. It is desirable, it is honorable to walk in righteousness. Let no one deceive you, church. We live in a generation where people are looking, even in the church, a lot of people are looking down on, they call it legalism. It's not legalism. It's not just a knowledge thing of righteousness. It actually has to take root in us and be lived out by us. It is our identity. It is beautiful. It is something to be proud to walk in. Righteousness. Righteousness. 
Let's go on. It is said that the breastplate was the heaviest weaponry that the Roman soldier wore, sometimes weighing up to 35 kg. Point. What's the point we can take here? Church, walking in righteousness isn't always easy or the most comfortable. It isn't always easy or the most comfortable, although it offers the most protection. It isn't always easy or the most comfortable, but it offers us the most protection. It is heavy. It requires determination. It requires discipline to walk in righteousness. It requires endurance to keep it on. It requires all of those things. But it offers the most protection. Remember that. It feels heavy. There's a temptation that could come to our minds. The temptation is this. You may sometimes feel like, you know, how when women come and they've done a whole day's job and they're wearing a tight bra and they come and they take it off. Ah, oh, they feel free. You may sometimes want to take it off to have a breathing space. You may sometimes want to take it off. I just need a bit of some freedom. The temptation, it offers the greatest protection. It offers such good protection. Don't be tempted. Keep it on. It is heavy. It is uncomfortable. But it protects. Righteousness. I heard about this testimony of this man of God who said that when years ago, when he was serving in ministry, there was an investigation that was taking place in his life. And this undercover cop, cop that he came to know later on, the man told him that, you know, they were following him for years, months. They were tracking him. And every time they were, they, you know, they had this accusation and he was thinking, they, they were thinking that he was involved in something. But they said as they followed him, day by day, they found him going to church to pray. They found him going home, spending time with his wife. They found him in the right places. Eventually they gave up. Why? Because the accusation brought to him or against him did not match with the life that he lived. He disproved it by the way he lived. Righteousness is key. Let's move on quickly. The breastplate was extremely elaborate and beautiful. It was made either of bronze or, bro of bronze or brass, usually brass. And the more Roman soldiers wore their breastplates as they walked and marched, something incredible would begin to happen. When you rub two shiny pieces of metal against each other for a long time, they begin to add a luster to each other. They begin to shine. Can you imagine seeing the, the soldiers on a summer day marching towards you with your shiny breastplate in the sun? I mean, I wouldn't want to stand against the Roman soldiers if I saw them with their armor shining. Church, that's what it's like when Christians walk in righteousness. It shines. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Do not be deceived. Righteousness is important. Let me bring it to an end. This is an important bit, church. This is for those who do not know the Lord. Let me just bring it to an end. So the gospel and righteousness. So we talked about the breastplate of righteousness and how it is the righteousness of God given to us in Christ Jesus. We talked about that. We talked about the responsibility of putting it on. We talked about that as well. But the righteousness of Christ is not only a protective shield against the attack of the enemy. The righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus ultimately shields us from the wrath of God. Ultimately, that's what it does. There's an appointed day of judgment where sin will be judged, where sinners will be judged, where those who commit lawless deeds will be judged. There's an appointed day. You can be sure of it. The other day I saw a video, a disturbing video of a Christian woman lying on the ground surrounded by men with sticks beating her to death. She was murdered there. You can be sure of it. If they do not repent, they will face judgment. You can be sure of it. That abusers will not get away with it. You can be sure of it. The other day, I saw another video, sad one, 
This man was arrested. Praise God for that. He went into a house and he was looking to kidnap children. Can you imagine the sort of demonic things that go on in this world? How people can be captured by such evil. Even just the cries of hearing a young child should put someone off. But we have such wicked people in the world. You can't be sure of it. If they do not repent, they will face judgment. There's definitely a day. On the other hand, we have those who are generally good law-abiding citizens. People who have not even been arrested for a crime before. Praise God, I'm one of them. They contribute to society. They pay their taxes. They have a good family. They even give to a charity every month. Such a person would say, I am a good person. I am a good person. I don't do all of these things. And by definition, yes, they are good. But the shocking truth is this, church. Our goodness does not equate to the righteous standard of God. It doesn't meet it one bit. It doesn't. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says this. We are told that our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags. And let me go further into this. The Hebrew word that is used for filthy is the word ida. That's the Hebrew word. It literally means the bodily fluid from a woman's menstrual cycle. That's what it means. Ida. The picture we have here in its literal sense is that our righteousness is like a soaked used menstrual pad that is being presented to God. Will he accept it? Will you accept it? That is our goodness. That is the person that says, I am a good person. I am a good person. That is what you're presenting to God. That is your standard of righteousness. That's the reason why Romans 3, 23 to 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Church, that is the reason why salvation in Christ is necessary. It's not optional. Because it is God's gift to us. It is his gift that he has given to us. Let me end with this quote from C.H. Spurgeon, which puts things into perspective. C.H. Spurgeon says this, talking about self-righteousness and the person who says, I am a good person. I can stand before God. Surely I would get into heaven. I am a good person. This is what he says. He says, self-righteousness exclaims, I will not be saved in God's way. I will make a new road to heaven. I will not bow before God's grace. I will not accept the atonement which God has routed out in the person of Jesus. I will be my own redeemer. I will enter heaven by my own strength and glorify my own merits. Indirectly, that's what the person is saying by rejecting the grace of God in Christ Jesus. He says this, The Lord is very wrath against self-righteousness. I do not know of anything against which his fury burneth more than against this, because this touches him in a very tender point. It insults the glory and honor of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it does. So I want to present this to you, church. We've talked about righteousness, standard, but this is key, ultimately. Church, by God's standard, we all need a savior. We all need this righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can be the worst sinner like those men I described, or you can be the good person that has never been arrested before. But God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son, as a gift of grace to be received that you may be right before him. Don't be tempted to stand before him in your filthy garment. Don't be tempted to say that I am a good person. He's a righteous God. He's gone all the way to give you this righteousness in Christ and then you reject it and present to him your filthy garment. Don't be tempted Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Walk in righteousness. 
receive this, this gift of grace today. Amen? Amen? Long message. Shall we pray? Father, we just come before you right now. And Father, we prepare our hearts to come and share in the bread and cup together. Heavenly Father, we've heard about righteousness, putting on righteousness, walking in righteousness. And Lord, I just pray that, Lord, even as we come to share in the bread and cup, we pray, Lord God Almighty, would you prepare our hearts. May we be aware of the righteous standard of a holy God. Lord God, if there be sins that we need to confess, Lord, help us that we may confess those sins. For Lord, it says that if we do confess our sins, Lord, you are faithful and just to forgive us. Father, I pray for anyone here who perhaps, Lord, is walking in the pride of their own goodness. I pray that in humility that you would convict them and bring them to the knowledge of the saving grace in Christ Jesus to receive this free gift, we pray. Father, come and have your way among us. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, for your word is living and active. Thank you for lives that are touched and are being transformed in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.